Matthew chapter 12. Now, this little mic does something. As most of you know, Jerry is sitting over there, and he's got a bunch of buttons to play with, but he's also got a little cassette tape. Now, this little mic, it takes the sounds, the noise, and so forth, and it records it. And sometimes I'm just a little bit uh, apprehensive of wearing this thing because uh, what I say is recorded, isn't that right? What I say, and it doesn't make any difference whether I like it or not, whatever I say, right or wrong, is still recorded. All right, now let me read something for you. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For... By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now then, as you read further in the New Testament, you find that a number of times the Bible speaks of this matter of idle words, jesting, and etc. Now perhaps this has given some a bit of a problem with reference to what they say and what they do not say and how they conduct themselves uh, day by day and uh, uh, what comes out of their mouth and etc. And uh, uh, I've been uh, greatly exercised of uh, recent uh, uh, days and weeks and so forth um, with reference to a truth that I am afraid many uh, do not take it very seriously. At least uh, I hadn't given it a great deal of consideration and thought before until... Um, uh, we've been having some good times in our Bible study at Searchmont, and I've enjoyed it tremendously. And I want to share something with you this morning. In this connection, probably we'll do uh, quite a few things as I have the privilege of sharing with you. Now, in the context of Matthew chapter 12, just so that we know where we are dispensationally, the Lord Jesus Christ has been ministering and he has proven himself to be the promised Messiah in a number of ways. In fact, you have his introduction as such in the first chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. You have the announcement of such. You have his temptations or testing that he's a, the bona fide promised Messiah or king as far as Israel is concerned. And then you have the great Sermon on the Mount where you have him speaking. And at the conclusion of his speaking, the people marveled because he spoke with such authority. And you have his platform for the kingdom that he has come to offer Israel. And then the next thing you find, you find him proving to be the proper Messiah or the proper king by the works that he does. And then the next thing that you find, you find the proof that he is the promised king or the Messiah by virtue of his workers. 
And by this time, there's so much evidence built up that he is the proper king. He is the Messiah. He is the one that the word of the Lord uh, had mentioned that you would just think they would all flock to him. But that's not the case. Right there in the first part of the chapter of the eleventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, you find how he is rejected. And from that point on, he begins to announce some terrible judgments because he has been rejected. And in this particular chapter, you have an accusation leveled at him. And that results in what is often called the unpardonable sin. And that is attributing to the person of Jesus Christ and by virtue of his ministry that he did these things in the power of Beelzebub or Satan. And then he announces some very, very harsh words such as in verse 31 through 32 wherefore I say unto you all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age, neither in the age to come. All right. We have here then a context that deals with what people have to say, with that which is being spoken. And dispensationally, the unpardonable sin relates to attributing to Christ the work of Satan through the Lord Jesus. And that, of course, in his incarnate state is not bona fide for today. However, there is a principle that is laid down now, a principle that we need to take heed of, and that is the principle of the matter of speaking or what we have to say, the words we speak, and etc., beginning with verse 33. And he gives us this truth by virtue of some parables. And he gives us two parables or two figures involved in a parable that zeroes in on this particular truth and then the peril that follows in light of the parables. Now notice, if you will, these two parables either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. All right, now then, the illustration which he is zeroing in on, as far as the unpardonable sin is concerned, but which results in a principle that we're going to see is bona fide even for today and for any time, is this. He says, I want to draw an illustration for you from a tree. Now, a tree is either going to be a good tree or a bad tree. Now, how do I know that I have a good tree or how do I know that I have a bad tree? If I've got an orchard out there, what is going to be the final test of whether I am going to keep that tree or not keep that tree? That's exactly right. By the fruit that it bears. In other words, that which it produces tells me whether that tree is a good tree or not. And if it doesn't produce fruit, what am I going to do? I'm going to cut it down and I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it for firewood or destroy it in some measure. In other words, the emphasis of the scriptures at this point is saying this, that which is evident, that which is produced, shows me the proof of its validity whether it's good or whether it's bad. A bad tree 
It ain't going to produce any fruit. It's going to have fruit in keeping with its character. What it is. Now then, he says, now, you group of people that have been so kind to make these accusations as you have, I've often, I've often had to shake my head. There are two people in, 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 in the Gospels that are the most undiplomatic people I, I, I know of. And do you know who they are? The Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. Now, he w they wouldn't get away with that today. They'd lose their pastor in a hurry. You know that? Look at the words that he has to say. Can't you just see someone going into one of these liberal churches and standing behind this desk and say, Good morning, you bunch of hypocrites. Good morning, you bunch of vipers. You snakes, you crawling rascals, you. That's quite an approach, isn't it? Well, now, what does he say in verse 34? It isn't a church, but it's a whole nation. Oh, generation <coughs> vipers. Generation of vipers. Well, what kind of a tree is he talking about here? He's talking about a tree that's kind of a poisonous tree. Isn't that right? Oh, generation of vipers. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the man speak, speaketh. So, in keeping with the illustration of the tree, now he says, the mouth proves the heart. Isn't that right? Exactly right. That's what he's saying. Your mouth proves the heart. Down at our television station, um, you know, we've had a big time down there. I don't know what it's going to be like this year. Jerry, Jerry knows those people real well. And um, uh, the guy that sort of headed it up this last year, um, I had the chance to uh, uh, speak to him. And the rest of them, they, they apparently have done some talking too. And um, uh, one day I, uh, uh, I I just put the B to him. I said, uh, "You you need to be saved." Oh, I'm saved. You're saved, are you? Sure am. You trusted in the. Lord Jesus, you sure have, absolutely so. So I go over to my buddy here and I say, Jerry, that guy says he's saved. And Jerry, he kind of cocked his head. Yeah, um, he, uh, he's one of these fellows that, um, that has an ability to talk in accordance with with his crowd. 
and uh, yeah, he told me just straight to my face without batting an eye, he trusted the Lord Jesus. He was saved and all of this. Well, a, a few weeks after that, I was sitting there uh, drinking a bottle of pop and uh, eating a candy bar, waiting for the fellas to get in gear, and I was going over what I was going to say. And this fellow was on the telephone, the open door right around the corner. Now, I, I didn't care to listen to, but pretty soon I heard him. You never heard such foul language in all your life. And it was just kind of blue coming through that open door, you know. He didn't know I was sitting there at all. Because if he had known I was sitting there, he would have probably uh, not said some of those things. But he used every vile word that uh, he could... Uh, his tongue could concoct at that time. Now, my Bible tells me, say, that for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Isn't that right? Now, words come out of the mouth in accordance with the character of the heart. That's what the Bible is saying. And he goes on and likens this now, instead of a tree, to the values of life, the treasure. Notice this. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. Now he elaborates upon it, but it's still within the context of the proof of the, of the product. So, the tree, the evil tree, cannot produce good fruit. Now, if you have an evil treasure, evil treasure, okay, that kind of treasure is going to come out, isn't it? Now, if the treasure is good, if the heart is good, if the heart is right, then out of the heart the man speaketh. Okay, let me just stop you here for just a moment and say this to you. Why then do Christians sometimes have a little trouble with that uncontrollable member? Hmm? Well, maybe you don't have any trouble. No trouble at all? No, no, yeah. Just as I told that lady, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. Uh, I was a pastor for a number of years. And there was a lady that I thought was just just a, a real top-notch lady there. Until the longer I uh, was pastor, I found out that uh, it just wasn't what I thought. And after a, a number of years, she came to my office to, to set me straight. Well, I need to be straightened out in a number of things, but I had had it. Now, that's all there is to it. I had had it, and I wasn't too diplomatic. I, I guess I'd been reading too much from the Gospels. But she sat across my desk from me in that office with her piousness and began to uh, instruct me as to what all I was how wrong I was and this and that. I said, just a minute. Now listen, there's only one thing that I can see wrong with you. And I called her by name. And that is this. 
your halo is all wrapped up in your horns. Now, needless to say, I didn't endear myself to that parishioner for one moment. But uh, enough is enough. And uh, so now, Dr. Clark, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, huh? Is that very good or is that bad? Well, what about this old generation of vipers? Is that good or is that bad? You know, honesty sometimes has to be pretty pointed. And here it is. But now then, we can have problems with this little member. And why can we have problems that are not right. It's because even though our heart may be right with the Lord, we still carry around something. And what is that? It's in nature, isn't that right? Sure enough. And so then the mouth brings out a little bit of the sin nature at times. And our mouth will usually prove that we are not perfect saints. But this isn't a reference to the matter of the fall, that which takes place periodically. It is that manner of the character of the heart. Okay? So, you're going to be known, and I'm going to be known, by the conduct of our mouth. I don't speak like I used to speak. I have a brother that just turned 80, could make the air blue. He got saved. The greatest soul winner I know of. That's my oldest brother. We often rib him about those days, and he <laughs> hangs his head and does this. He doesn't like to hear that. Well, none of us like to. And he could tell some things on the rest of us, too. But notice now the peril. Come right on in, folks. Notice the peril with reference to the parable. But I say unto you that every... Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That little microphone picking up over there on that little cassette is recording every word. Isn't that right? Every word. Ever done on you that there's a recorder in heaven? And that recorder is recording every word. That's right. Every word. Now let's understand what the word idle is. This particular Greek word is argon. Now that comes from a word which is called which is ergos, which means work. And when you put the alpha privative to it, that gives you the opposite. Instead of every workable word, it's every unworkable word to get the idea across. 
Now then, we're talking about a manner of life. And in this connection, notice what he says in verse 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Because the expression of the mouth proves the reality of the heart. And he is saying simply this. I hear you. And what is coming out comes out because of what's in the heart. And that which is the unworkable is the evil. And you're going to find throughout the entire scriptures that every single area of judgment for the church, the second advent, and the great white throne. As we'll deal with it later. Always emphasizes works, works, works. Do you know why? Because the works are the manifestation of the reality. Why now? Why will Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, the second advent, and the great white throne judge according to what we see? Colossians chapter 1. Let's go. Colossians chapter 1. In verse 15. Speaking of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature of all creation, for by him were all things created, come right on in, that are in heaven and that are in earth. Notice the next couplet. Visible and what? Invisible. Can you see words? You can hear them, can't you? You stop. Think of that creation up there. Do the animals have a means of expression? Stick around here after I, after I tie silver up and you'll hear him. And I could pretty well tell by his bark, by his sounds and so forth, what he wants. Now when he sees that I'm up of a morning, when I had him tied up there at the edge of the house, Comes to the door. He doesn't growl. He's telling me to hurry up and get out there and turn him loose. And that's what he's telling me. Do the moose out there have a means of expression? Do the mice of the field have a means of expression? Do the birds of the air have a means of expression? In the eleventh chapter of the book of the Revelation, he confounded the languages, created the different tongues, 
Now get something. Who did this? Jesus Christ. Why is he recording every word in the heavenlies? Because he made your mouth. Now let me go on. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And what for? What for? For him. Now it's high time. Absolutely so. High time for every single man, woman, and child that takes a step upon the face of this earth realizes that as a steward of the Lord's creation upon you, we give an account. What you say is for me. Not yours. Now you've got to believe that. He created the things both visible and invisible for himself. And he says, You hear it can tell and if you can tell don't forget my recording that's going on we don't fool him not for one moment we might express something the heart isn't right with the Lord. And he even knows the thoughts and the intents that we're going to deal with probably next Lord's Day. But this is something I'm confident Christians don't realize. Nor do, be. do you realize that every single godless word that's spoken in a beer joint, a, a slopping on a corner, or any honky tonk, or any godless business, or any political conniving, every single one of those words are recorded for future judgment. Do you realize that? And so are yours, and so is mine. Every man will give an answer for every unworkable word. And the unworkable, of course, is the unworkable for good as a steward of what he has created. The visible 